started the first one now. Okay, so um, you already discovered that, that when we are designing, from my point of view, we should be precise and we should sometimes use some kind of formalism to make sure we are precise and it's clear what we decided and it's clear why we decided it and we can communicate about the design, communicate about the things we are looking at, but we should also communicate the decisions we make. And today is about design decisions. So you could say the step from task number one, the current situation, to a first idea of a new situ situation, task number two. That's what we are talking about. Uh, so um, obviously we start with requirements from task number one, and in fact, all groups, as far as they are now presented, actually found out what should change, what should improve, what doesn't work. So th this helps you to set up requirements. Um, setting up requirements, by the way, means changing things, uh, and consequently you uh, might want to talk to your client again and say, we are thinking to change this one. Is this acceptable to you? So, uh, Never forget that the client is the one who, in the end, has to accept your design. So, so if you are changing things, well, negotiate, if, if need. Right? Uh, uh, and on the other hand, you consider what's possible. What possible in the sense of techniques, what, what is available now, or what will be available very soon, or what is um, expensive, or, or could fit, let me say, the budget of the company of your client. Um, you should also look at what's ergonomically acceptable, uh, ergonomic in this type of design is first of all means can users understand do users like the experience are users happy about using this um, uh, does it fit in their context but, but ergonomics could also actually mean physical things like can I read all this information on the screen of a smartphone which, which is not so much a, a mental thing but just a, a matter of how, how good are our, our eyes and, and and if there's audible signals, can I hear the signals when I'm using the smartphone in the bus? Um, or or the, when people have to press buttons or move on the screen, can people move in, in, in enough detail to, to <coughs> hit the command they want to hit, right? So ergonomics is everywhere. And then legal issues. Is this acceptable? Is it acceptable from the point of view of privacy? Privacy laws, is it acceptable from the point of view of, of broadcasting? Uh, of making noise in trains. In some parts of the train you cannot make noise, so your smartphone should also not make noise. Right? So, uh, and, and, and all of this helps you to, uh, to find out what's possible, and to find out what is not possible, and to find out where, let me say, more information, more creativity is needed. Right? Uh, and, and what do people expect? I mean, your customer, your client, will probably have some expectations already about your redesign. Think, well, hopefully they are going to redesign this part or to change this. So, um, now I like again to introduce some kind of formalism, and actually you might already know this. this is, I'm going to talk today about design rationale. It might be a known concept, or it's not. No. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to show you a very, very, very simple formalism, but a formalism that helps me. So, the, the formalism is built on questions, on options, or possible answers, and on criteria. Uh, questions meaning there is a design request. Uh, for instance, where should information be available? Or how should the, the user provide an answer? And, and options indicates the different ways in, in which we could answer the question. Like we could say, well, you write it down on a sheet of paper and, and, and copy it. Uh, or you hit a button, or you choose from a menu, or you type and, and, and hope that you type a word that's recognizable by the system, so options. And criteria are reasons to accept or not accept an option. So a criteria could be, is the technique available in the shop? Or is the te technique available at an amount of money that fits the budget of my client, right? Or is it economically uh, feasible in general, or is it is it uh, ergonomically acceptable for users to handle this? Um, so Q O C, uh, and these are the three characters that are. Uh, if you would Google for Q O C, you would end up finding things like design rationale and the technique I'm now going to present. Right. So okay, now there's a couple of things. Who is the owner of the questions? Uh, and 
and uh, originally I think the owner of the questions is the client. The client who wants to improve things and, and his main question could be could you improve this thing or could you improve my business process or could you improve the way my users use uh, my system or my website, right? Uh, but, but in fact, if you are designing at a certain moment, somebody in the design team could say, I am interested to make things cheap, and, and, and my question is about economic aspects. So, so somebody is the owner of the question. Uh, and always be clear who owes the question, meaning who is interested in the first place to ask the question, and who will in the end make a decision. Because if I ask a question and you come up with different possibilities, it's my question at a certain moment, I will say, this is what I'm going to do. Right? So, so the decision will, will be related to the owner of the question. Okay, and, and then, in order to find out, you have to find out all different possibilities, all different options, and to find out all different criteria that could be relevant. And, and, and who could come up with options? Well, anybody who is a designer or who is known, uh, who, who knows the field. Uh, so in the design team, there, there could be somebody who is focusing on visual design. So this person might come up with options, with options that, that are related to what's visible, to how you shape things, how you color it, how it would be on the screen, or how it would be on the console. Um, uh, and, and other options could come from somebody who is interested in the software. How should you program things? How should the, the software be, be structured? Um, so, in order to, to come up with, with options, you, you might need to have information from as many different expertises as possible. In a real-life design team, there will be an ergonomist, there will be a software engineer, there might be a, 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 a graphical designer. Well, all, all these people represent different expertises, and all of them should provide their options. And in a way, the same is for criteria, because if it's about criteria, the person who is the visual designer or the graphical designer will, if he's an expert, also know about human visual perception. So he would say, this is something people cannot see from a distance, or this is something people cannot see in the dark. Right? So the criteria, again, would come from different disciplines. Uh, and so what I'm going to, to suggest is that you use some kind of a guided brainstorming on generating the options and generating the criteria. I mean, sit around the table with all experts you can get hold of and ask each expert to find out options for the question. The question is, from, is owned by somebody, but all of us should create options from your different disciplines, so the options could be from completely different ways. Like making it like making it smaller, uh, use use better colors, um, uh, program it in such a way that the system will be quick of uh, any type of, and, and then the same is for criteria. So the different disciplines will naturally come up with different criteria. Right? So even if the question is owned by a single person or a single instance or a single client, the options and the criteria might come from as many relevant disciplines as you can find. Okay. So, uh, and I would like to have a formal representation. You found out that I need it, and, and you find out already that it worked. And all of you did some kind of formal representing the, the, the impressions you got from your client. Uh, this helps. It helps communicating between disciplines, and it helps communicating with the client and the stakeholders if you can be precise. If you can say, these are the different activities, these are the different goals. This, uh, this task is a primary task, we cannot change it. This task is a secondary task, we could consider to change it, right? So, so I need some kind of formalism to communicate in the design team and with the stakeholders. And as soon as we formalize things, we can go back. We could make a decision and then find out that there's a new possibility, new technology is on the market. You could step back and reconsider your decision as long as your decision is completely described. Formally described. So this is the two reasons for having a formal representation. Even it's simple in this case, but I think we need. Right? So one is for communicating the decision to everybody concerned, and the other is for stepping back if later on you find out that, that the price has changed, or that, that the, the law changes, or that there are new technical possibilities. 
let's go back and reconsider the decision and, and not have to reinvent the wheel again. Okay, sources. Well, so, task model one brings up requirements, the, the, in, the initial IDs of the customer, um, inconsistencies you find out when you do the task modeling, problems you identify, conflicting goals between the different stakeholders, uh, and, and all of this could add up to develop questions for task number two. How could we change this aspect? How could we get away from? How could we make this more easy to understand? So, task number one will help you to raise questions. And all the time be aware who is raising the question. Is it an original question of the client? Is it the question of you, the designer? Is it the question of the graphical designer who actually say, I am responsible for the screen. I have a question about screen wheels as they right? So be sure who is the owner, and, and these are the sources for the task, the queue. Okay, now about the criteria. Anyhow, the client has business goals. The client wants to sell a website, whatever you decide. Or the client wants to stay within, within the regulations of the municipality of Tilburg, or whatever, right? So the client has business goals that are part of the criteria. You cannot do anything that's against the business goals of the client or that doesn't support, right? But, but, and the client has visions, but there are also ergonomics and standards. Certain things are not allowed by law or are not allowed in, in, in ISO standards consequences. There are safety and reliability issues. And, and there's the issue of the corporate image. Your client wants his business to be looked at like, and, and here you have the mood board or, or the description of the corporate image in a way. And so this is a criteria. All of these, uh, and they mainly stem from the client, are criteria for acceptable redesign. But, but there's also legal issues, like the ergonomics and the standards and the safety is in many cases a legal issue. We are not allowed to, to behave unresponsible under the law in, a, in this country. In the so the C, this is where the C comes from. <coughs> okay? So. It makes sense to first identify a question or a couple of questions and then to identify in general or for some questions separately what are the criteria, when would an answer be acceptable. Uh, and you could do this, uh, especially the second one, by guided brainstorming. Uh, and and, and so you have the business goals of the client, you have in, in fact described them in detail, this was part of your task modeling, uh, and, and now you should find out what all criteria are relevant when we are going to find an answer. And then here we have the options, and obviously technology is a main source for options. We now have smartphones, we now have phones with bigger screens, we now have tablets, we, have, we now have the possibility to, to, to use a new technology in website design, like Ajax was a couple of years ago, right? So technology offers you possibilities and technology also offers you expectations because if you if you read the, the, the technology or the engineering journals you find out that probably within one year this will possible right and and, and and there's constraint things that you shouldn't do because it doesn't work so options are mainly based on what your knowledge of, of technology in relation to what you are designing okay so Q O C. Can you switch it off and on again? Mm -hmm. 